It takes a certain kind of mindset for the deep cave diving. You have to be a bit nuts. They're very, very dangerous. The high water level and the low visibility. Barely shoulder wide, pulling against very strong currents. <laughs> Last seen nine days ago, 12 boys and their coach are trapped in the flooded caves. Hello? Hey, they're here. How many of you? 13. 13? They're all alive. Uh, can we go out now? Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Jackie Alimany, a congressional investigations reporter here at The Post. It's been four years since the world collectively held its breath while global effort was underway to rescue 12 young Thai soccer players and their coach from a cave that they became trapped in during an unforeseen monsoon. Academy Award winner Ron Howard's latest project takes that story to the big screen. I'm delighted today to be joined by Mr. Ron Howard and actor Joel Edgerton to talk about 13 Lives. Ron, Joel, welcome to Washington Post Live. Thank, Thank you. you very Pleasure. much. Pleasure. Uh, and I also, for our audience, want to add a little disclosure. The Washington Post and Imagine Entertainment recently announced a partnership to produce TV and film projects. Now that that's out of the way, Ron, let's get right to it. What was the motivation for you to take this story uh, and, and make it into a feature film? Well, it began with a screenplay by William Nicholson, who'd already been working on it for a, a year. Um, producers uh, had 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 gotten rights, had connected with uh, Rick Stanton, uh, John Valanthan, and others, and and uh, and and through that, Bill had begun to really synthesize this into you know a movie narrative. Uh, and uh, when I when I read it, while I had been, you know, certainly aware of the story and relieved by the outcome, I had no idea uh, the the uh, the the different the different brands of courage that was actually on display and was required uh, for this to have been achieved. And I just thought it was a remarkable opportunity. I I love the cross culturalism of it. Uh, the, a lot of cinematic challenges for me as a as a veteran director. But first and foremost, it's that big idea. If the world could come together and achieve this for these boys, um, you know, what 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 else could we do? And they gave us this remarkable object lesson through that achievement. And Joel, your character plays a pivotal role in the success of the boys' ultimate rescue. What was the most surprising thing that you learned about Dr. Harris? And, and it's sort of that brand of courage, as Ron mentioned? Well, the, the, the big surprising thing for me is, is you know, the, the mechanics and the how of how they got the boys out of the cave, which, you know, in that initial news cycle, like, like everyone around the world, I was glued to. There were aspects of that rescue that were uh, kept sort of hidden from the public. Yeah, there was a slightly controversial aspect to it in the planning of it in terms of how they got the boys out, especially knowing that as that plan was being activated and, and, and thought through, there was the risk that it wasn't going to be successful. So there's an understandable reason why the big surprising element and, and Dr. Harris's skill as, as a medical practitioner and how that was implemented um, and crucial in the rescue, why that was kept secret. I was excited to learn when I got involved with the project about those aspects. My jaw literally was on the floor when when you when, when I started to learn and I think as audience sort of learn the mechanics of the rescue. The, I, I call it the threading of the eye of the needle or, or, or this sort of high wire act of how it, it went down. That is, is a marvel and it continues to, to shock me even more today as I think about it. Yeah, actually, I meant to Google this after watching the film earlier this week, uh, but one of Dr. Harris's initial reactions to this plan that Rich proposes to you during the film is that it, it's unethical and potentially problematic in that regard to put these kids under as, as an anesthesiologist. Can you go into a little bit more about some of the ethical quandaries that maybe you studied while playing this part? I think the big salient point for me was, was how 
it became a pivotal aspect in Dr. Harris's life and potential future. I mean, no one had ever tried that before. You know, the idea of, of uh, making anybody unconscious in a, re a rescue situation, particularly underwater, had never been achieved or tried. The idea of it felt uh, like it was unachievable. There was a real risk that in doing so, it would speed up the risk of danger for the children and, and lead, in the worst case scenario, to the death of a child or more. When you talk about how this uh, situation came to a head as the waters were rising um, and the oxygen was depleting and the theory of keeping the kids in the cave throughout the whole monsoon season, the feeling was they were going to die if something wasn't tried. Now, what was really important for me is learning that Dr. Harris was hit with the crisis that if he didn't help and didn't try, these children were likely to die anyway. So he was willing to take the risk on the hope that the plan, as difficult as it was, would achieve the survival of at least one or more or hopefully, you know, the majority of the children. But his feeling was there was a certain risk that at least some of the children would perish in the attempt. Um, but better result than all of them perishing. That to me felt beyond medical and incredibly deeply personal when you look at an ethical and wonderful man looking down the barrel of the rest of his life knowing he could have been instrumental, feeling that he had uh, harmed children in attempting to help them. And what Joel is talking about as it relates to his character and the characters that the person that he's playing is 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 sort of what I found throughout the movie. And it went even beyond the divers and went beyond Dr. Harris. It went to, you know, a, a whole kind of this amazing level of volunteerism and and problem solving uh, under duress. There's a scene in Apollo 13 that people always want to talk about. People use it in in film classes. They 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 use it in history classes. And it's where they're. They all just put a bunch of junk on a table and say, okay, the oxygen levels are running low. This is all they have to work with. How can we create, uh, you know, a, a, a scrubber uh, so that we can recycle the air? And, and, and you know, it's, it's, all, it's all based from my interviews with, with people from NASA. But everybody loves that by the seat of your pants problem solving. And I kept encountering this over and over and over again in this movie uh, from people who, you know, weren't necessarily professionals, you know, paid to work together. Uh, they, 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 were the, they were there because they cared about those kids. Yeah. And a reminder for our audience quickly, we do want to hear from you. So if you have any questions throughout our program, please tweet your questions at us using the handle at post live. Ron, you actually created the perfect segue for my next question. Although the successful rescue mission was largely tied to the cavers, the film does show that it really took a vast effort from thousands to accomplish the mission. Can you talk a little bit more about how uh, you showed the extent of the sacrifices made by local communities uh, through, throughout the world to contribute to the aid and rescue of these boys? Well, we, we, you know, we had the framework of our story, the, the, the framework that actually occurred. It's a great movie narrative. Um, one of the things that you can do in a scripted version is um, try to create that, that connection for the audience on an emotional level uh, with a, a, a variety of characters through understanding those characters' relationships. And, um, you know, and it's just, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's visceral. That's what drama uh, is is for so my job was to first understand and then allow the audience to connect with the you know the 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 the, the questions that would arise you know uh, the flood flooding is coming uh, X Y and Z ideas are not working what else uh, and uh, and and what will it mean and how does it how does it feel to be on the ground there in that camp or in that cave or up on that mountain trying to help divert rainwater that was flooding into the cave and they were trying to find ways to 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 uh, create this diversion program uh people were you know slipping sliding breaking legs unbelievable uh and all there because they you know they wanted to be so it's really just a matter of doing the research and then connecting it to scenes building relationships and recognizing the potential for uh you know for drama 
uh, and and trying to share that in a, in a little over a couple of hours in a in a um, you know a compelling way for audiences. Joel, I'm not sure if I heard you cough or laugh when Ron said people were slipping all over the place. Did you sustain any injuries during this filming? That was definitely a cough. Yeah. Uh, no, I think um, the 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 question of injuries was always. Uh, I mean, I definitely we definitely scratched our hands up. I remember early early days doing these makeup tests where we were getting uh, incredible amounts of uh, scratches put on our hands. And the moment you went even into the set, the cave sets that that uh, Molly had had designed and constructed, which are incredible when you see the film, you realise just how sharp these caves were. The, the big thing was understanding this when it came to um, the difficulty of underwater cave diving, zero visibility, the amount of equipment you're carrying, um, just how dangerous it was. And I think it really underlines the fact that as the world it got excited about the children being found after a, an extended period of time, just how difficult the task of getting them out was um, and how extraordinarily unique the skill of underwater cave divers are and rescue divers that meant that it wasn't an easy situation to just teach a bunch of young children to expect to have 30 years of diving skill in the space of a day or two. And I, I can't think of a better word than the one Ron used, uh, which is that this film is visceral and gripping and in some parts pretty difficult to watch, knowing how strenuous some of the rescue operation really was. We, we have a clip from the film, so actually let's take a look. Let's have a look. But what they come fast? Bloody hell. We'll have to dive them out. Joel, <laughs> what did you know about caving and diving before you landed this role? Very little. And, uh, you know, a lot of what I knew about cave diving came from watching the, the news about the, the cave rescue itself. And I knew that there was, like, this sort of thin percentage of human beings that w were interested in um, cave diving, and I certainly never imagined that I'd be one of them. I mean, I, I still can't promise you that I would ever go on a, a crazy cave dive, but I'd be willing to dip my toe into it. I knew so little. I knew very little about scuba diving. We, I have to say at this point, like we were led by an incredible team of divers, you know, particularly Rick and, and Jason, who were there on the actual dive, the rescue themselves, but an incredible team of Navy divers and rescue divers and salvage divers that guided us in a very quick amount of time from, from being novice divers to being able to, you know, on screen, pretend the skill necessary for what was uh, required of us in the film. And, you know, it's it, even in a studio setting, you realize how difficult and dangerous it is. And, and we were very lucky to be led um, by such an incredible team. 
And, and Ron, the 13 survivors would have no idea during their time in the cave that their story had captured international attention. You are a director who really digs into the research and the story. Can you talk a little bit about that process, getting to know these boys and when they learned about the impact that their story had uh, on a global scale? Well, we had no access to the actual boys. So everything uh, 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 through contracts, arrangements through the Thai government and so forth. So all of our research was based on observation, uh, you know, divers who had gone in and seen the kids. And of course, you know, a fair amount of journalism done immediately after and uh, and, and also during, which had profiled uh, kids. And, uh, um, you know, and, and their story was kind of, elegantly simple. Um, the coach was remarkable. He managed to keep them calm. The fact that they were a team to begin with meant a lot. Also the fact that they were from the North. Northern Thailand is a, is a, is a, is a, in some ways a challenging place to grow up. It's beautiful, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fraught with some, some social, uh, tensions and, 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 and difficulties and economic challenges and so forth. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a lot of the um, Thai actors who I was working with and also our consultants and so forth all said that, you know, these these boys from the north are tough. And we actually put that line uh, into into the uh, in, into the into the movie. I relied a lot on the actors to become collaborators. I, I, I had co great a couple of great co-producers, uh, uh, you know, who's one both of whom have done some writing to to do the translation, to interface with the actors in their own language, and and uh, you know I just kept imploring them don't don't let don't let a false moment get through. You've got to you've got to tell me. I'm not going to feel insulted. I'm not going to be upset. It's not it's it. This is what we must do. Uh, you know, among three or four other goals we've got to achieve, we've got to have that authenticity. Because I also recognize, you know, not 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 only is that is that appropriate, but you know, as a viewer, I, you know, I want to know that that care has been taken, and I want that insight. And the perform the actors are gonna are you know are gonna reach a more emotional level and with more more more. You're, we're gonna again that pathway to to empathy that I'm always trying to build through these kinds of scenes and situations for the performances to the to the audience is is going to be there if they really own and believe in uh, everything that they're saying and doing and and the kids had never acted before so you know for them it, it it's very honest very raw and they're very they're, it's very easy for them to connect this experience to themselves um uh, elsewhere we had real you know experienced professionals who i relied upon why, why didn't the Thai government want you to directly interface with the boys? We didn't ask. I mean, they already, they're, it's, uh, um, you know, it, that had already, we, at, by the time I came onto the project, that was clearly understood that, you know, that, that uh, uh, rights had been defined. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I took our producer's uh, uh, word for it. I think also, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, this is me surmising, um, you know, I think there was a, a, a there was so much chaos a, around the story um, that uh, you know I think that it, to some extent they wanted to to um, put up a little firewall and protect the boys who are still growing, still going to school uh, from uh, you know some kind of on, onslaught. And Joel, I'm, I'm sure that for any parent watching this film, it would be impossible not to feel for the parents who are really in agony to learn that their sons are trapped in this cave and, and might not survive. What about the parents' stories did you learn in creating the film? And, and did they see this experience as a test of character? Look, I, I was on my way barreling towards fatherhood as we were shooting the film. In fact, I became the father of twins. Uh, a week or two before I even wrapped shooting my Congratulations. Session. Thank you. <laughs> and as that was happening, I was thinking more and more about parenthood, the idea of your children being trapped and not knowing and, and having that, that terrible question mark, um, I think was one of the reasons why the entire world was gripped by this. It's like as humans, we empathise about other human beings interestingly and understandably, despite culture, religion, race, any of that thing, stuff, when human beings go missing, we 
place ourselves in that position, we watch because we care, and particularly when they're children. The idea of having to empathise with um, what the parents felt, I think, is an, is an easy situation for anybody. Um, in the film, the, you know, the, there's so many moving parts in this film, and in the film, the, the, the point of view of the parents is, is really distilled into one particularly significant character who personally as a as a watcher of the film is one of my favorite characters and i think it speaks volumes to that empathetic aspect of, of why we're all drawn into this story is a lot of it came down to how would it be not just to be one of the children and the fear of not knowing but to be one of the parents being helpless on the outside not knowing what what is possible and, and what the outcome was going to be and I don't think I'm spoiling anything by saying that we all know the boys ultimately survived being trapped in the cave for days on end. But if they had not survived, would you, Ron, have been as inclined to produce this story as a feature film? Well, there'd be a, a di there'd be a different set of of sort of human conditions surrounding the story, and I don't I can't imagine what they what they would have been exactly but um you know had 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 that process led to something that i felt could still be cathartic for audiences it would be tragic sure but you know would there be something to learn from it still um then possibly you know i'm i'm <laughs> as a as a storyteller you know i'm in i'm i'm inclined to uh to sort of look for stories that that reinforce the viability and plausibility of of uh, of of optimism <laughs> Uh, but, um, but, but again, I would, I would look at, at, at sort of what the thematics that that outcome yielded and, and what, and what, what do we learn and where's the drama in that? Um, particularly again, you're going to make a scripted film. You've got to be thinking about the fact that, um, uh, you're sharing information, uh, but you also need to, to engage something uh, deeper, the nervous system that becomes cathartic for an audience that then it becomes, you know, uh, 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 you know, engrossing and, and entertaining as well. I want to dig a little deeper into that because obviously humanity has been through a bit of a harrowing and unusual period of time over these last few years through the coronavirus pandemic. I'm wondering, other than catharsism, what do you think audiences right now are looking for when they are using film as an outlet in their everyday lives? Well, I mean, uh, you know, it, for, for, for all time, storytelling has accomplished a number of things, and it's all a version of entertainment because what we want is to, you know, to, to, to be engaged, and we, you know, we benefit from this. It can be escapism. Uh, it can relieve tension. That's you know, incredibly viable. There are there are there are all kinds of genres that that provide that information and that and that sense of of uh, empathy and catharsis uh, is, uh, is 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 also a way in which human beings uh, you know engage with narratives and get something out of it that gives them something to to talk about, to think about, to to uh, you know to 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 uh, to grow with, and. Audiences more and more are being offered, you know, a wide array of, of formats and approaches. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm also directing documentaries here at Imagine Entertainment. We're doing short form. We're doing branded content. We're doing, uh, you know, movies and, and long form television and, and, and the documentaries. But it all comes back down to story. And story is always about um, character, thematics and answering questions. Uh, you know, stimulating curiosity and and paying that off in ways, whether that's, you know, really broad, playful, fun comedy or, um, uh, you know, darker tragedy uh, or, or um, you know, the sort of the recreation of, of uh, inspiring events as we have with 13 Lives. Mm. Faith plays a crucial role in this story. We learn that the soccer coach led his team through meditation and prayer while being trapped in the cave. We have another clip here, which we're going to look at, which gets at a bit of that role that Faith played in the boys' ultimate survival. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
ผมต้องขอโทษด้วยนะครับที่พาเด็กมาเสี่ยงอันตรายไม่จริงครับขอโทษครับขอโทษครับขอโทษครับขอโทษเกณฑ์ที่สุดครับ is because of our coach we are stay strong he teach us to meditate โคดบอกให้เราสนุกครับ and we pray we pray and yes we pray it too วิดีวิดีนี่คือจะออกไปไหนดีงานโจ were you surprised to learn the extent to which faith impacted their survival? Yeah, I remember when this happened, uh, and and early in the shoot, I remember joking about if if that was 12 10 year old versions of me in that cave, it would be a very different um, moment that the divers discovered. I I I would have imagined myself to be incredibly selfish. Um, Fearful and desperate, and and not to say that that they there weren't a, a, a an entire tapestry of feelings those kids went through and experiences they had. One of the things that really moved me and broke broke my heart is watching the video of when Rick and and John first discovered the children about how organised, how polite, how um, almost bizarrely casual they were about about. That discovery did not seem like 12 boys and a coach who'd been um, trapped without knowing where and how for for 12 days. Or, um, and I think that that faith had a lot to do with that. And I think that the coach's uh, uh, ability to rally those boys and and to instil a sense of confidence in them through meditation was important. And I think. Having travelled extensively in Thailand myself, um, there's a mysterious elegance and beauty to Thai culture which I can't even begin to understand, having never lived there uh, myself. But there's an impressive nature that perhaps is founded in 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 their faith um, that says a lot. And as I said, if that was if that was 12 versions of 10 year old me in there, that scene <laughs> would look and I. You know, I don't mean to be facetious. That scene would have looked very different. It would have been like, get me out right now, please. I'm scared. It's so interesting to hear Joel say that because a couple of the divers mentioned, you know, just as we were talking to them, interviewing them, um, you know, well, maybe more than a couple that they went into this not thinking about spirituality as a factor, but there is a lot of, you know, a lot of mythology around the mountain, uh, the sleeping princess. Maybe this was a test of the boys. Maybe it's a test of society. These kinds of questions, and they, you know, they went into it with a degree of cynicism. And we sort of, de you know, we demonstrate this in the in the, in the movie. It's a reflection of several conversations that I had. And by the end, you know, they had to wonder. And um, of course, that region in the north also has its own specific version of Buddhism, which also includes uh, some some um, uh, belief systems that preceded Buddhism, uh, but have been sort of synthesized into uh, so, so some of their ceremonies and uh, and and prayers. Uh, again, I I leaned heavily on research, but sure, but also um, I cast a lot of actors from the north. Who would have an intimate sense not only of that very specific dialogue, dialect, um, and phrasing, um, but again also culture. And it was a great experience for me creatively to see certain scenes shift and evolve uh, into into something else. And some of these moments around the spirituality um, were, were very uh, meaningful and potent uh, to me, and you know, and put me in a in a in a mindset. To uh, take that aspect of the movie very, very uh, seriously as it related to, you know, sort of empowering people to carry on and um, uh, and make this possible. Again, I thought of the whole thing as kind of an anatomy of a miracle, um, and which is a kind of a glib way of of saying it. But I, but I, uh, um, but I, um, sometimes I do that with a film just to sort of 
keep checking moment by moment, scene by scene. You know, are we are we understanding this? And I and I, I wanted to, to to be sort of as dimensional as I could about that. Um, but um, I, I also wanted to be very granular and understand it on a lot of different levels. Yeah, you do see some of that faith. Ultimately, you, you make some subtle allusions to it rubbing off on the divers uh, after the experience is, is said and done. But uh, we unfortunately only have time for one question left, but I think um, it's it's the perfect question to end this conversation. Ron, this is a question from an audience member. Uh, James from North Carolina asks that about you have directed other movies based on actual events and persons such as Apollo 13, Beautiful Mind, and Frost Nixon. What similarities and differences may have been a factor in your determination to direct 13 Lives? Uh, well, when, when I first made Apollo 13, I was terrified of tackling a true story. Um, I thought it would limit my my creativity, and, and I found it to be the opposite. And I also really loved the way it connected with audiences, not just that the film was popular and well regarded, but I, I but it, you know, on a personal level, the way it stimulated people's um, sort of connection to the story. You asked earlier about ways that that films can entertain. You know, every every genre, even when it's playful fantasy, you know, it's really about transporting an audience and stimulating their imagination. And I found that in this this sort of you know this kind of nonfiction scripted kind of storytelling, you could do those things. Uh, and in fact, the audiences were, were really ready for it. So I had I had confidence. That even though I didn't know anything about Thai culture, uh, I'm claustrophobic in caves myself. Uh, I had just no experience with that. Uh, that that th this was a great story, and there there were a lot of those details that could be connected, could answer questions, could stimulate an audience's curiosity, and and pay off in a in a in a in a really rewarding way for uh, for an audience. And it would be an interesting personal journey for me, which, uh, you know, it certainly was. And Joel, you get the final word. What message do you hope people will take away from having watched this film? Well, it's a, it's the same message that really drew me in to want to be a part of this film, apart from, you know, the excitement of being able to, you know, go to work for Ron, is this story, you know, you asked before about the outcome. The fact that the outcome was positive and given, like you pointed out, what we've just been through, what everybody's been through and their own uh, version of the last few years has been an undulating series of highs and lows for some incredibly low. Um, to, to have a true story that shows the strength of human collaboration, uh, the sense of human empathy and what is possible when we all come together selflessly to solve a problem for other people, um, despite the lines of culture and, and all these things that otherwise divide us, is such a great thing to be able to see at the moment. And the fact that it's true underlines for us that it is possible. It's not just some fictional dreaming. Uh, it's, it's, it's there to remind us that um, no matter how difficult things are, people will put aside so much of themselves in order to reach out to help other people. I wanted to be involved in that. Ron, Joel, we're going to have to leave it there. Unfortunately, we are all out of time. Ron Howard and Joel Edgerton, thank you so much for joining us today and congratulations on a fantastic film. Thanks thank so you. much. Great talking to you. And thanks to all of you for watching. To check out what interviews we have coming up, please head to WashingtonPostLive.com and find out more information about our upcoming programming. I'm Jackie Alamani. Thanks again for joining us today.